Happy Easter. Welcome to ABC. I want to thank you for being with us today, especially if you're visiting. I know there are many churches you could be in on a Sunday morning like this on Easter. So thank you for joining the ABC family. We're so glad you're here because Easter Sunday is a special Sunday. We are gathering today to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And today we celebrate that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life we cannot live. He died a death we deserved, and he was raised on the third day to give us hope for new life. And so today we come together along with gatherings all around the globe making the same proclamation that was made on that first Easter Sunday, that Christ is risen. Some of you don't know, but you're participating today. You didn't know you signed up for that when you walked in, but you're going to help me preach today. And the reason why is the Easter message is too big for one preacher, because ultimately every born again believer in Jesus Christ is called to preach the same message, that we are all testimonies to the validity of the resurrection as the old has gone and the new has come. So today, as we celebrate and we worship together, we also proclaim together that Christ Christ is risen. risen Jesus was raised on the third day and then he walked for 40 days here on this earth. And we're told over the course of those 40 days, he spent a lot of time with a lot of people and he was very public during those 40 days. The Apostle Paul says he was seen by as many as 500 witnesses at one time. He shared meals with people, he taught people, he spent time publicly, but he also spent time purposefully. He sought after specific individuals that needed a special touch from the resurrected Lord. And one of those individuals is a guy named Thomas. Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples, but Thomas also struggled after Good Friday. Because Good Friday was not good to Thomas. It really brought a lot of doubt in his mind as he watched the Savior of the world die on that cross He was confused over what was to come next. And so Thomas drifted. He doubted. But what we see today in John chapter 20 is that Jesus does not run from Thomas in his doubts. Instead, he runs right after him. And this morning, perhaps some of you would say you've drifted in your faith. Or maybe there's some in this room that have doubts. I want you to know that Jesus is running after you just like he ran after Thomas. And what we're going to see today is that Thomas gets an opportunity to experience new life, and you have that opportunity as well, because Christ is risen. risen If you have your Bible, join me in John chapter 20 is where we are. John chapter 20. And I'm going to begin in the 24th verse. This is what we're told. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into the side, I will never believe. So we're introduced to Thomas in this text. And the first question we got to answer is who on earth is Thomas? John actually gave you a couple facts about him right there in verse 24. We're told that he's one of the 12. So he's one of the 12 disciples who walked with Jesus during those three years of public ministry. He spent his life following Jesus over the course of those three years. But he's also called the twin. In the Greek word, it's didymus, which means twin. And in fact, all the gospels identify him as this, and we don't know a whole lot other than he was a twin. He had a twin. He was known for being a twin. We didn't know much about his twin, but this is what we learn. But it's interesting, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, don't give much more information than that. That's about all that they provide about Thomas, but in the gospel of John, we learn a lot about Thomas's character. John first spoke about Thomas in this gospel in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, you might might remember Jesus says to his 12 that he has to go back near Jerusalem to wake up a guy named Lazarus. And he tells the disciples he has to wake him up, meaning bring him back to life. And the disciples push back against Jesus saying, you can't go back near Jerusalem. They're trying to kill you. But who speaks up in that moment? It's Thomas. 
Thomas says, let us go with him that we may die with him. You see, Thomas had courage. Many people miss that, but Thomas had great courage, but he also had questions. We see that in John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, following chapter 13, where Jesus washed his disciples' feet, he shares that last supper with them, but then he tells his disciples, let not your heart be troubled, but believe in God and believe also in me. And he tells them, I'm about to leave you, because Jesus knew the hour was coming for him to approach Golgotha. And he tells them, where I'm going, he says, you may be with me as well. And he says, I'm going to prepare a room for you. And he said, you know the way to where I'm going. And then who speaks up? It's Thomas. Thomas actually says, Lord, we don't know the way. We don't know the way to where you're going. And how does Jesus respond to Thomas's question? Jesus famously says, I am the way. I am the truth, I am the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. You see, Thomas had questions, and these questions actually began to compound and grow when he looked at Jesus on that cross because he started to wonder what on earth is happening. And those questions escalate, and we know that because we're told in verse 25, Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. You see, in the preceding verses, we're told Jesus on that first Easter Sunday actually came to see the disciples. We're told when Jesus was resurrected, it was actually Mary Magdalene and ladies who first saw him as those first witnesses, but then Jesus spent that first Easter going to his disciples. And he comes to them to once again restore their faith to show that he is the risen Lord, but we're told Thomas was not with them on that first Easter Sunday. So the question is, why was Thomas not with them? Admittedly, it's a little bit speculative to put an answer to that question, but perhaps it's because Thomas was fearful. Because we're told the disciples actually had the door locked on Jesus because they were worried they were gonna die for Jesus. Jesus was dead, they thought maybe they're coming after us next. Perhaps Thomas is scared. But perhaps Thomas is also confused. Maybe he's thinking in that moment, why would God allow this? Why would God allow Jesus to die in such humiliation? Or perhaps Thomas was filled with pain as he's grieving the loss of his beloved mentor, teacher, and friend. And the reality is when we are confused, when we're discouraged, when we have pain in our lives, we all come to the same same position, the same crossroads. Will we run to God in our pain or will we run from him? And Thomas is running from him. He's not there on that first Easter Sunday. He's not in the room, but he has good friends because we're told in verse 25, the other disciples who were there, they told him, we have seen the Lord. It's worth noting when it says that, we, that they told him, it's in the imperfect tense. What does that mean? It means they are repeatedly telling him. They're saying, but Thomas, we saw him. Thomas, he's alive. Thomas, we saw the scars. We've seen Jesus. And have you ever had that friend that won't stop telling you about Jesus? Perhaps that friend brought you to church today, and I praise God for it. But have you ever had that friend that's pleading with you over and over saying, I've seen him, I know him, and I want you to know him too. I want your faith to be restored. Thomas had those kind of friends, and they're saying, we've seen him. But Thomas says, unless I see his hands in the pla- and I place my finger in the mark and place my hand in the side, he says, I will not believe. Thomas raises the ante because they say, we've seen the holes. Thomas said, I have to touch them. I need to put my hand in his side. And consequently, this is why Thomas has forever been known as Doubting Thomas. Now, I will tell you that name, Doubting Thomas, is a little bit unfair, I believe, 
because many people minimize the good character that was in Thomas, but he's forever remembered for those doubts. And why is it that I say Thomas should be not let off the hook, but maybe given a little bit of grace? I will say this, it's because all of the apostles doubted. We must not forget all of them actually doubted. In fact, when Mary Magdalene comes back from the tomb and she goes to seek out the disciples to tell them what she had seen, she'd seen the Lord, we're told in Luke chapter 24, verse 10, now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles, but verse 11, but these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. You see, the apostles did not believe them. It seemed like an idle tale. And perhaps in this room, for some of you, maybe it seems like an idle tale. Maybe you have doubts, but the difference is those doubts were alleviated when those disciples met the king of kings. They understood he was real because they saw him. But it's interesting that Thomas has doubts because he hasn't seen him. But Jesus is not offended by those doubts. And why? It's because Jesus is the way and the truth. And truth is not fearful of doubts because the truth is the truth. And Jesus does not run away from Thomas in his doubts. Instead, he actually runs right to him. He comes right to him, we're told in verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Eight days later means exactly one week. In ancient counting, they're actually counting the first day as one of those days. So this means one week later, literally the first Sunday after that first Sunday. The first Sunday where, if you will, the church gathers together and they are there in that room following the resurrection Sunday. Who is the one that comes into the room and stands among them? It's Jesus. And I love that it says the doors were locked and that was no obstacle for Jesus because the tomb could not keep Jesus in and a locked door cannot keep him out. And so Jesus makes his way into that same room, the same place he was a week before, but why is he coming back for a second round? He's coming to see Thomas. He's coming to restore his faith. And you see, he hasn't given up on Thomas. And what I want you to hear is this, Jesus also won't give up on you. Jesus won't give up on you. Isn't it amazing that Thomas is running from God and God just runs right back after him. And he won't give up on him. In fact, Jesus spends a good amount of his time during those 40 days on this earth actually going after the people who wandered from him. In the following verses, we actually hear about Peter. Peter, the very one who said he would stand with Jesus against everything, and then he denies him three times in his darkest hour. Yet Jesus does not give up on Peter. Instead, he pursues Peter. And he finds him at the beach, and he makes him breakfast to restore him. If you think about James, James was the half-brother of Jesus. He actually grew up with Jesus, watched Jesus grow in wisdom and stature, yet we're told James mocked Jesus. He did not believe in Jesus. But when Jesus was raised from the grave, who does he go after? James. He doesn't ride off James. Instead, he goes after him. And then even Thomas, with all these doubts, Jesus is not done with him. He pursues Thomas in his doubt. And I want you to know today, if you have breath in your lungs, he is still pursuing you as well. I was thinking about at my house, I have this camera on my doorbell. Many of you have this as well. And this doorbell camera is a wonderful little piece of technology because when the button's pushed, it starts recording. And more than that, it actually pushes a notification to my phone so I can see who's at the door. And I remember one time that button got pushed and I was not home. I think I was at work that day when it happened. And I see on my phone that it's going off and that somebody's at the door. And I look and I can see it's somebody trying to sell me something. They have a clipboard. The picture's pretty stereotypical. I know what's happening. And so I watch them. I just ignore it. But then that button gets pushed again. And then I pulled up the live feed. There's a little bit of knocking. And he's being resilient. He's not leaving. 
But the beautiful thing of that app is you can actually talk to somebody through it. So I just pushed that little talk button, and as politely as I could say, I said, sir, I'm not interested. No thank you on what you are selling. And after I said no thank you to him, you know what he did? He left. Because that is the normal response to rejection, is it not? That when you're rejected, you say, well, oh well, I'll go another direction. But the amazing thing with Jesus is he is so much more resilient. He doesn't give up. Even when you say no and you wander and you doubt and you do these things, what does Jesus do? We're told biblically he keeps knocking. He won't stop. In fact, for some of you in this room, you've been hearing that knock on your heart for years because Jesus is relentless and he will not give up on you. And the book of Revelation says the wise person will let him in the door. In fact, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, this is what Jesus says. He tells us, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will eat with him and he with me. Jesus shows up in the room to see Thomas. And what Jesus says is he's knocking on the door to see you as well. And my question is, do you hear Jesus knocking on the door of your heart? If so, I encourage you to open up that door because Jesus won't give up on you and he stands there knocking because Christ is risen. So what happens when that door is open? Jesus goes through the door, and we're told the first words he says are, in verse 26, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Notice he didn't say shame be with you. Guilt be with you. Condemnation be with you. He didn't say, how could you, Thomas, you coward? How could you question me after those three years, after you saw everything you saw, after you experienced everything you experienced? No, what's the first word he gives? It's peace. He says shalom to you, to all the disciples. It's the same word he said to the disciples the previous week when he was restoring their faith. He said shalom, peace, wholeness. He says, I want to give you peace, Thomas. I want to actually alleviate that pain in your life. And this is what Jesus came to do. He did not come to steal, kill, and destroy, but he came to give life and life to the full because he is the Prince of Peace. He says, peace be with you. But then he says, notice what he said. Verse 27, he invites Thomas. He says, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. And he implores him, do not disbelieve, but instead believe. Isn't it amazing that Jesus already knew what Thomas was thinking? And it's not because the disciples sent a text to Jesus and said, hey, you won't believe what Thomas said last week. No, it's because Jesus is Jesus. And he knows the things you think. He knows when you wander. He knows where you go. And even amidst that knowledge, knowing our biggest failures, he still says, hey, come a little closer and get to know me. Come take a look. Come here. And he invites him to come and look at his scars. He doesn't close his hand off to Thomas. He opens it up. And he says, come here. He says, if you want to look at this, look at it. If you want to touch it, touch it. And it's interesting, we don't know if he actually did. It seems that Thomas had probably heard enough at that point, and he didn't even have to. But Jesus invites him to come and examine those scars. He says, don't disbelieve, but believe. It's a gentle exhortation to Thomas saying, I want you to come close to me. Stop running. Come look. See who I am. Examine me more closely and surrender your life to me. And what he's showing Thomas is what he's showing us this morning. Jesus will give grace to you. Jesus will give grace to you. He doesn't give condemnation to Thomas. He gives grace and why is it that he wants Thomas to come and look at his hands? It's not just because that's what Thomas said. It's because his hands are actually a symbol of his grace. Because Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 says that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. 
While we were still sinners, Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us. The very holes on his hands and the hole on his side is a symbol to the love and mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Thomas, I've already been killed for all of your failures. Just come take a look at this. Come look at my hands and see these holes because your debt's already been paid for. And I want to remind the Christian in this room that's fallen, I want to remind you, your debt's already been paid for. All sin, past, present, and future, has been fully atoned for through the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, come and look at my hands. And I find it interesting that those holes are there because Jesus is resurrected. He's in this glorified, permanent body, yet he still has holes in his hands and his side. Why is that? I will tell you, it's not because Jesus forgot to heal himself. It's not because Jesus was lacking power. It's not because he got tired and he just didn't finish the job. Jesus left those holes on purpose. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we've been studying this. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, John gets to see the throne room of heaven and he says, I see a lamb who is standing, but he has the appearance of being slain. You see, even right now, Jesus Christ in his glory in heaven still has those holes. Why is that? I believe it's for two reasons. The first is he wants all of the world forever in heaven and on earth to know of his endless grace and love that it will always be a reminder for all of us as we spend forever with him for eternity, that as we look to his hands, we will always remember the love and grace of Jesus Christ. But I believe he keeps those holes there for another reason. It's so that even us today, we might understand this point, that Jesus understands pain. How do I know God is good? It's because the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And Jesus Christ put on this human flesh and he endured pain. And sometimes we think we're the only ones in pain. Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I understand your pain. Jesus understood physical pain, emotional pain, and spiritual pain. In the same way, some of you, I will say, you're in pain today. Some of you are enduring physical pain. You have disease and ailments. Some of you have emotional pain, anxiety, broken relationships, trauma. Some of you have spiritual pain. You're carrying shame and guilt over your life. And what Jesus is saying is, come to me and receive grace. Because you don't have to carry that shame because Christ already carried that shame for you. And Jesus says, I'm ready to give you the grace you need today. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, this is what we're told of the grace of Jesus Christ. We're told in verse 15, we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then... With confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. My question is, are you in a time of need? Do you need a little bit of grace today? What Thomas would tell you is Jesus' hands are open for you right now. And Jesus is prepared to give you all the grace you need in your time of need. But it requires you to respond to the Lord. And I encourage you to do so just as Thomas will because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thomas hears his voice and he responds. Verse 26, Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? He says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What is Thomas' response to the grace of Jesus Christ? He says, my Lord and my God. It's worth noting he doesn't say, Jesus, you are the Lord and the God. He doesn't say that you are this abstract, distant idea of a deity. He doesn't say you have this power that's mysterious and distant. He does not say that's who you are, nor does he say you are Peter's Lord and Peter's God. He doesn't say you're John's Lord and John's God. His response is, you are my Lord and my God. And this is the rightful response to understanding the grace of Jesus Christ. 
His grace demands a response, and his response is surrender. He says, you're now in charge of my life. I give my life over to those nail-pierced hands. I belong to you, Jesus. And this is the right response for all of us to his grace. In the same way, I want to encourage you today, I hope that the Lord is not just your mama's God. I hope that the Lord is not just your preacher's God. I hope the Lord is not just your friend's God because Jesus wants to be your God. He wants to reign and rule over your life and give you life to the full. And what we see through Thomas's confession is this final point. Jesus wants a relationship with you. Jesus wants a relationship with you. That's why he said in verse 29, blessed are those who have not seen, but still believed. Jesus understood that he was about to ascend back to the right hand of God. He knew that right now in this moment, he wasn't gonna be physically standing in front of you. Although I will make note, he will physically return one day. And in fact, we'll be studying that next week. I invite you to come back. But in this meantime, in this age of grace we live in today, Jesus says, blessed are those who believe, but they haven't yet seen. You see, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, Hebrews 11.1. 1. And Jesus says, blessed are those who believe even though they haven't yet seen. How are you blessed to make Jesus your Lord and God? You're blessed twofold. One, you're blessed eternally because now you have heaven awaiting you. Jesus prepares a room for you, that all of eternity is ahead of you, and it's already been bought for you through the blood of Jesus Christ. You are blessed eternally, but you're also blessed presently, because we're told when you make Jesus your Lord and your God, you actually receive the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, and suddenly you have power to walk in newness of life. And you can experience new life, just like Thomas is starting to experience in that room through his faith in Jesus Christ. But you might say, how can I believe if I do not see? I'm so glad you asked that question, because John answers it for you in verse 31. He says, but these are written, all the things of John's gospel, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John says, I've written these words so that future generations will believe. That's why this book still works 2,000 years later. Some people silence the book and give you less Bible. I believe you need as much Bible as I can give you. And the reason why is the word of God is alive like Jesus, sharper than any two-edged sword. And when the gospel is proclaimed, the word still speaks. And as the word speaks, we're told the helper, the Holy Spirit, convicts. And the Holy Spirit shows us the things that we're hearing are true. And the Spirit helps us, compels us to make Jesus our Lord, our God. And in addition to all of that providence, God also gives all the witnesses of this world Christians in this room that can tell you his resurrection power is real because they've experienced it themselves. And the point is, God doesn't just want you to hear about his power. He wants you to actually experience it yourself. A couple years ago, I went to Israel. It was my first time, and I went there and saw all these places that I'd heard about, and it was an amazing trip. One place we went to was called the Dead Sea, if you're unfamiliar with the Dead Sea, it's the lowest elevation point on land, some 1,400 feet below sea level, and it's this body of water that has highly concentrated salty water. The water is actually about 10 times saltier than the ocean waters, and consequently, this water has a mysterious power. It's able to make you float really easily. In fact, I'd heard about that for years, that you can get in this water and you just start floating without even trying to float. If you'd say, Jonathan, I can't float. Yes, you can. Just go to the Dead Sea. You will float. And I get there to the waters, and it's my first time to show up, and I see the waters, and I've heard about the waters. I've heard of what this can do, and I put my foot in the water, and I realize those waters are a little colder than people told me. That is a little colder. Part of the problem was it was December in the Holy Land, and I'm feeling those waters, and it's a little bit cold. 
And I have to make a decision in that moment. Am I going to hear about those waters? Or am I actually going to experience it for myself? Because I could leave there and come back home and say, well, I've heard about it. I know what it can do. Or I could come back home saying, I've experienced what it does. And the same way you can leave here and go home and you could talk about what the power of Jesus Christ can do, or you can experience what the power of Jesus Christ can do. But I have to warn you, you'll never experience his resurrection power by putting one toe in the water. Instead, what Jesus requires is your faith, that you go all in, just as Thomas, saying, Jesus, you are my Lord, you are my God. And my question for you this morning, is Jesus knocking on the door of your heart? If so, Thomas would tell you, open up the door. Don't hear about the water. Instead, experience the living water of Jesus Christ because that water is alive today because Christ is risen.